minute if I was talking with a deviation has taken a particular remote interest <laughs> while my colleagues get the camera ready. I mean, it's not me, but it's working. But it's working. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> funny things happen to me on the way to the theater this morning. <laughs> I thought my arm started. Yeah. No. Yes. Okay. Right. All right. In that case, I will. Uh, we will get started. I'll say good morning again. Um, hello. Thank you all very much for coming today to Sort of Mark Foundation. Uh, if we haven't met, I'm James. I'm the director of the SMF, and I'm very pleased to have another James here today with me. Uh, Lord Bethel, who is here to tell us about how Britain can be the healthiest country in the world. Um, before I talk about that, actually, these the housekeeping bits of what we have to do here. Um, yeah, we haven't got a fire alarm plan this morning, so if anybody starts shaking and bell and whistles go off, there is a fire. The exit is at the back door out there. There's a button you have to press to open the door, by the way. Don't flip the switch, you turn the lights off. Um, the other thing is that that gene there. Um, you know, it was well as the people in the audience people in the room today, we are also live streaming this uh event to to to, to YouTube. Uh, which means when we get to the question section, if you're I'm sure engaging, engaging, keen on questions, uh, your questions will be heard not just by the people in the room, but by people out there on the internet. And also, the recording of the session stays up online, so you're uh, you're preserved in digital digital posterity for all time afterwards. So I think that will be the only bits of uh, bits of housekeeping in terms of the content today. Uh, so you, you know, you know, speech will, will speak for itself. Uh, it all comes out to a lucky conversation we had in this room at a round table we were doing on public health, since public health is one of the things that we are very interested in at the SMF. And uh, James said that the yeah, session that we, we weren't ambitious enough in our general discourse about health, and that we, why we why you said why is no, why is nobody saying that we can be the healthiest country in the world? And I said that's a good point. You can give a speech saying that. Here we are. Um, if you haven't been to the SMF before, uh, we are a cross party think tank. Uh, you know, doing work on lots of different public policy questions, particularly at the moments of public health and, uh, and prevention questions. The cross partiness is quite important um, to us. Uh, we are, you know, this room is open to people of all parties and none become, come and give speeches and talk and think and, uh, and uh, engage in public policy conversation. It's very important that we that we try and try and annoy people equally on both sides of politics. And having had a sneak, pre a sneak preview of, of James' speech, I think there's there's something in there to uh, to offend everybody. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and that's supposed to be a thought. That's before we get to the Q and A. So uh, with with that with that promising warm up, um, I will now hand over James will talk for about half an hour. And yes, we'll, and then we can do and then we can do we can do we can do questions and questions and come conversation and then go back. Oh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, James, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. And thank you very much indeed to James and Hannah and to the whole SMF team for bringing this uh, together. Uh, the work you've been doing in health is really commendable and really got me um, motivated uh, to do this. Um, my name is James Bethel. I was um, Life Sciences Minister during the pandemic, uh, which was an incredibly busy and, and actually ultimately very inspiring time uh, to do a little bit of public service. Um, I came out of it with a very strong sense of how unhealthy we are mm -hmm. as a country. Um, morning spent uh, looking with Simon Eccles and Kevin Fenton uh, at the uh, ICU numbers edging up uh, and talking about how many people there were with diabetes and other comorbidities waiting in the emergency uh, department really left me with a strong sense that we had to work harder to make this country uh, more healthy. And that's why I stepped up to James's challenge of how to spell out and how we make uh, Britain uh, healthy. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that uh, a little bit. Okay. That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, as, everyone, as, as all the health historians know, um, Derek Wong was warned 20 years ago that if we didn't make uh, Britain healthier, um, we were going to be overwhelmed by a, a sharp rise in the burden of avoidable illness. Um, and uh, uh, immediately in the uh, public service agreements in 2004, there was hard coded in policy. I mean, you don't get much more commitment than you than, than putting it into the uh, spending review that uh, we would reduce health inequalities and, and increase longevity. And that's been reiterated time and time again. I mean, recently in the letter we got paper uh, in the NHS uh, long term plan, um, uh, the commitment to a higher longevity and lower uh, inequality. Um, is a really 
potent political um, promise, the elixir of life. Um, and uh, it's been absolutely doubled down on in uh, party manifestos, which would be conservative party uh, manifesto. Um, and, and ministers love making it. Yeah, it's nothing quite like telling you that we're going to get you uh, to, to live longer. Um, uh, so if we achieve those two objectives, we would become the uh, healthiest country in the world. That would be a good route to achieving uh, the, the headline objective. But the honest truth is we haven't. We keep uh, um, falling down uh, the rankings. What these little blue dots show is that when the Queen, at the coronation in 1952, when the Queen um, uh, was, was, had the coronation, we were seventh. And it was only really Norway and Sweden and some, you know, the thick of the healthy countries that were ahead of us. Uh, and now we're 29th um, and slipping further and further. Um, whereas countries like France and Japan, uh, you know, have done quite well. So that is a pretty grim performance, uh, and it's not, there's no sign of it uh, getting any better at all. Now, the route out of this is relatively well charted. I'm not here to give you a clinical description of how you become a healthy country. Fred uh, has spelled it out in pretty dark terms, like he does, and like I got quite used to during the pandemic. He points to smoking, unhealthy diet, harmful consumption of alcohol, and insufficient physical exercise. In other words, a very traditional public health agenda, and that would get rid of a huge amount of the disease uh, that causes uh, early death, inactivity, misery, and economic um, uh, pressures on our country. And John Bell and his ilk, uh, I was a life scientist minister, he's the life science evangelist, very much championed, and I'm, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more, the technologies that are newly available, using the engines of innovation, big data, AI, genomics, to plug it into uh, the delivery of things like better diagnostics, uh, polygenic risk scoring, um, and vaccine. There's a whole host of fantastic technology coming down the line, some of which has been applied, a whole lot more uh, is on the horizon. And that in itself is going to have a huge impact, uh, I think, on the uh, on the health uh, of the nation. And in fact, quite a lot of the broader um, uh, requirements to make uh, Britain healthy are already absolutely written into policy. Um, the national food strategy is posited as a pretty clear, uh, straightforward plan to making for breaking the junk food cycle. The clean air strategy um, really, really would clear up a, a lot of problems. Moldy homes, um, and the ton view on smoking, very, very clear recommendation. It's not as though we haven't nutted out the necessary um, requirements for um, making uh, 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 the, the, the country uh, a lot better. And in fact, the prevention white paper lays out an absolutely clear strategy um, that uh, re will reduce the demand for healthcare, incorporates restrictions on marketing and access to the SIM products, support for those who are carrying morbidities and addictions, moves to address the wider determinants health uh, and the application of, of, latest, of the latest technologies. So um, uh, why is it then um, that um, we haven't um, uh, sort of made any progress on this? Well, it isn't through um, lack of um, focus by the think tanks. Um, DBI, Center for Progressive Policy, OHE, and IPPR um, have all made uh, a lot of progress on this. Uh, um, I think this is, um, they have um, chronicled um, exact, some really clear plans for how we can um, uh, take it from here. So, what I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, going to slightly go because this is the out of date presentation. <laughs> oh, you don't blame Shantan the one that I sent this morning. Apologies. I'm sorry, I should have checked that this morning. Yes. Everyone. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Events and James. So you are amazing. Thank sorry, you very much. Sorry, I know.
I'll read the slides. Yes. The slides went. So, um, so the prevention, if you're able to do the slides, that would be great, but I'll keep reading while you're here. Yes. I, I emailed a, a set of slides first thing this morning to events, James Kirkup, and to Hannah. So the prevention white paper makes clear that the pivot to prevention can have some immediate impacts on demand, but it's going to take a generation to put Britain to the top of the health table. So some interventions that we can do can have short-term uh, fiscal impact, um, like uh, uh, smoking, and, and some have relatively quick returns, uh, like SIDL, and it's good to see Alfred here from uh, the OHA who uh, put so much work into that. There are also some big infrastructure investments like on multi homes and greener spaces that are going to require billions and billions, tens of billions of pounds of investment, and are going to require a much longer time frame. And there are improvements to our society, to our social fabric, like safer communities and resilient families that might take a generation to turn around. So, in other words, uh, if we're going to think about an agenda for change, we do need to think about a blend of short term uh, and long term and of big fiscal events uh, and small fiscal events. We also have the big challenge, uh, therefore, of trying to manage both the flow and stock uh, of sickness within our society. The stock of sickness is around 25% of our population who already carry some sort of chronic disease. And those people need to be looked after and there's no going, getting away from the fact that they will need to continue to be looked after. But we also have uh, the uh, requirement to invest in the flow of sickness. And that is the investment in new health technologies, improving our environments, constraining businesses with taxes and restrictions to stop the flow of investment. Now that's a, that's a classic uh, system transformation challenge. It means that today's young people are paying for the mistakes and illnesses of today's older people, but we're not investing in uh, the, the uh, good health of the younger generation. It's a classic integrational uh, political challenge. Now, in fact, many of the necessary... Um, so for me, COVID really put uh, a spotlight on Britain's poor health, particularly the comorbidities like obesity. But it also created some terrific opportunities to improve health data, to deploy the latest diagnostics, to roll out uh, modern vaccines, and to engage the public who are newly literate in health matters. And I was just chatting to uh, Kevin about how to make the best of a bad emergency. We really did think as we went through the pandemic about how we could build uh, better infrastructure um, and to take advantage of the investments uh, in the pandemic. Um, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, several think tanks have thought about how we can do that. But despite these good intentions uh, and energy policy making, the health of the nation continues to decline. Worryingly, um, we seem to be living at the moment um, in a state of PINO, prevention in name only. In policy terms, a lot of the prevention space is completely dead. NHS waiting lists are constantly in the headlines, so resources for NHS pay rises and waiting at times suck all the budget from everything else. So for instance, the funding for institutions like UXA are lower now today than they were before the pandemic, which is absolutely extraordinary. Tensions within the Conservative Party are so intense, uh, and any MP has a black ball on almost any policy, uh, that even the four modest obesity measures passed by Parliament uh, were reversed at the end of last year. And there was almost nothing uh, on the runway. The Community Diagnostics Hub programme, which was so promising as a step forward on the prevention agenda, has stalled through lack of cash uh, and so on. Now, the results are that on the prevention agenda, we're going backwards, not forwards at the moment. Vaccine uptake for 13 and 14 of our diseases are behind WHO targets. Screening programs for important diseases, including breast, prostate, and cervical cancer, are behind target. We utterly dismantled the COVID testing infrastructure for pathogen surveillance, reducing our commitment to mass research trials and government investment in vaccine innovation. And I noted the sale of the BMIC facility that I visited as a minister. Uh, in, in, a, in a quite odd uh, fire sale and the dismantling of the vaccine passport. 
the adoption of new um, uh, technologies within, within the NHS has slowed to a snail's pace. But it's not just the operational um, freezing of the prevention agenda that worries me. It's the political freezing of the, of the prevention agenda. I was really shocked two weeks ago when uh, the announcement was made that we reached 5 million people in the UK with diabetes. Um, and the reaction to that was a shoulder shrug by uh, almost the entire country, certainly by um, the medical community. I should say that an expensive person with diabetes, someone who gets diabetes in their 40s and gets a, a severe doses, can cost the country a million pounds. It's one of the most expensive conditions on both the welfare budget and the health budget that you can have. And therefore, these numbers are going to cost our country an enormous amount. The shelving of the Khan review recommendations by the public health minister, Neil O'Brien, was again greeted with a shrug. In fact, on that day, the BMA announced that our health crisis would be solved by paying doctors more money. Um, and the public health grants, uh, which have been uh, cut, um, uh, was greeted from the LGA uh, with a sense of disappointment. And it said the LGA said that it made it difficult to plan uh, ahead effectively. Now, that gives to me a sense that there is simply no one out there trying and demanding uh, more work uh, on the prevention agenda. The setbacks have passed without a mutter. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how could this possibly be? So my contention, what I want to say to you, is the fundamental problem with uh, the prevention agenda in the UK is not the policy. Actually, we have loads of policy, and lots of it is either uh, on the table waiting to sign up or actually hard-coded into the, stru uh, the structures of our, of our making. It's not the law, and it's not even the funding. The healthcare system is currently spending more money than it's ever, ever spent before. It's the political architecture of health uh, in the UK. And what I mean by, by it is this. Conversations in health in the UK are totally dominated by the public's profound commitment to free access at the point of delivery. That NHS commitment is a, uh, a national religion, it's a totem. It's one of the most wonderful things about the NHS. There is no way that anyone is going to seek uh, to change that. But I can tell you, as someone who sat through many, many focus groups uh, about health, it is like a white noise that rounds out all other conversations uh, about, uh, about health. And I would commend uh, the Engage Britain work uh, uh, on, on this matter. It casts the NHS as a fallback plan that promises to put you back on your feet uh, when you are ill. And that is a lovely and reassuring thought that is at the back of a lot of people's minds. But it's a one-sided contract with no obligation on the patient, voter, taxpayer. And it's based on this assumption. It's based on the assumption that if you're sick, you can somehow be rebuilt to perfection. But the grim truth is that most major sickness leaves us irrevocably damaged. If you have a heart attack when you're 40, you're going to lose a unit of your life, and there's nothing any doctor can do about that. The second piece of the architecture uh, that is problematic is the neoliberal climate of personal responsibility, one person, one vote, equal in front of the law, free markets, free expression. Now, these are all values that I'm going to die in a ditch to fight for. Uh, they, are, they are the things that hold together uh, our uh, liberal um, civilization here in the UK. But when it comes to preventative medicine, the dominance of the idea that we are all responsible for everything that happens to us, particularly when it's paired with a commitment to free access, implies that we can somehow completely ignore all the other health consequences of our behaviors, our behaviors as individuals, uh, our and the behaviors of the companies uh, that we run. In other words, the health money tree will always pick up all of the pieces and we shouldn't blame anyone else but the individual for their health uh, uh, outcomes. This, the, the, the prevalence of this uh, idea is currently making it incredibly difficult to take a prevention agenda forwards. And thirdly, there is something about the nature of the way in which our NHS is constituted that creates a huge stumbling block. Uh, it is a faceless, centralized black box, very, very little uh, democratic accountability. Uh, I can speak to that. 
uh, having tried to get Simon Stevens on the telephone to ask him about the Sindad, he said me and the NHS management certainly don't think that they are uh, necessarily accountable to Parliament. There's very little transparency, though that is beginning to change. There's very little decision making, and, and there is engagement, but not what I would call decision making. Or, uh, and the connections to uh, the health of its communities are extremely weak. The power is very much focused on acute medicine uh, and the senior management of acute trusts. There are 125 or so leaders of acute trusts. They are the ones with the with the um, checkbooks uh, and the, and the uh, nodes of power within the health systems. The NHS is highly sensitized to the whims of ministers, but it is almost impermeable to the worries of mums and dads that their children may not live as long as they do. And that is not a great system for trying to address uh, a prevention agenda. As a result, the politics of the NHS are quite deliberately focused on inputs like waiting times and not outputs uh, like healthy longevity. And that was a decision made by politicians 25 years ago, and we're living with the consequences. So in other words, the, the popular and cultural psychosis around access, the individual, and the scapegoating of the NHS, blaming the NHS for every single health outcome in the UK, uh, results in politically uh, a competition between the parties, uh, a race to promise infrastructure and the workforce to underpin the access commitment rather than uh, the health of the nation. And I've got some beautiful pictures here there. Let's demonstrate that. They're coming. They're coming. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Um, we'll come back to the pictures another time. If you looked yes, at the... <laughs> oh, thank you so much. No, I'm sorry, this is all my fault. Thank you. Harry. I was just thinking about it a little bit. Yeah, I know. I'm like swatting around and sort of green and cold instead of changing. You, you should have the conditions of doing the speech as well. No, no blue M&Ms in the bowl. I know. Yeah. No, no, no one his hand. <laughs> I'm pretty much honest, not the most fun at work, really. Yeah. Um, I'll continue. If you look at the election materials uh, of, of the major parties, there's an absolute focus on building 40 hospitals, hiring 50,000 nurses. Uh, delivering um, six million more GB. In other words, it's an infrastructure commitment, a workforce commitment, and a customer service commitment. There is no, nothing in there about the actual healthiness of, of families, of communities, or, or, or of the nation. Even Rishi, who's the smartest guy in the room, I mean, he's a very thoughtful person. Even he knows in his five pledges that it's waiting lists, which is the only conversation that's worth having uh, with the electorate at the moment. And if that is the conversation that, that the Prime Minister of Britain is having with the electorate, the prevention doesn't get a look in. We have a political culture that celebrates cheap lager, which is not an entirely bad thing, but it is to the absolute exclusion and to the competitive exclusion uh, of good health. But those who are struggling with their health are very often shamed. Uh, healthcare professionals are intermittently lionized and demonized in a rather sort of strange psychotic way. And the mythical nanny state is derided, even though the individual measures recommended by the nanny state hold incredibly highly. If you look at uh, uh, polling on interventions on gambling, the food cycle, dirty air, uh, get, um, uh, and so on, uh, the public are incredibly supportive. And this is an absolutely perfect climate for vested interest, for big industry uh, to what they call deny, delay, and divert, or to make um, everything or nothing arguments, uh, or what I call tic tac uh, a, a phrase named after my noble friend, Lord Vasey, who claims that the junk food advertising watershed will only save a child the same amount of calories as a single tic tac in a day. It's a classic diversion tactic of this kind. So in other words, if you do an audit of the key national uh, prevention programs, we are operating in uh, prevention in name only. 
So this is this is the the, the um, disappointing assessment of where we are today. But where where do we go from here? Now there's a temptation to hope that some kind of uber held, some kind of um, big political figure, a prime minister, will, will charge in and change everything overnight. And that is ultimately where, for instance, TBI and the Health Foundation make their recommendations. They call for big interventions by a prime minister. But I've got to be honest with you, prime ministers can't change the political weather. There is no prime minister who can get the public to engage in health if the public isn't paying attention. Major reform programs have got to last several electoral cycles. They both survive wars and famines and recessions and changing patterns. Mm -hmm. And I remind you that even the great Tony Blair, Gordon Brown and David Cameron and the rationalists of the old days, they all had opportunities to intervene on convention and they totally plunked it. Just read their diaries or talk to Camilla Cavendish about the climate in, in Downing Street. Now, Boris Johnson did get prevention. He nearly died in the hospital and he spoke very movingly about the five stone of extra weight he was carrying. But that commitment lasted four months. <laughs> and his adamantine resolve totally collapsed when a couple of MPs came in and threatened to resign. Uh, and he quickly uh, reverse ferreted um, and proved beyond doubt that top down intervention alone is not going to be the political answer. We've reached the difference. Oh my God, that is brilliant. Hannah, yeah. thank you very, very much indeed. I really appreciate it. Um, it's packing. <laughs> Trying to show you some. That's the architecture. Great to access liberal values, top down structure, obsession with waiting lists, 40 new hospitals, even Rishi, who I admire, has this on his list, which is incredibly disappointing. Uh, Richie has never had a drop of alcohol in his life, hold us back. He doesn't even like drinking, he doesn't drink. and there he is standing next to it. This is not a great political culture for the prevention agenda. Tory uh, MPs smearing people who are, who are overweight, showing people their health, GPs being demonized, Lord Daisy with his tic tacs. Like, That's quite funny, I think. <laughs> um, and this is a this is the um, audit of our prevention measures, and it is really disappointing. Uh, this is from uh, OHE Office of Health Economics. Um, so this is from TBI. Strong political leadership is needed to address the problem and tackle the major drivers of ill health. I'm afraid to say that is a political strategy. It's not where we need to be. And then it's also tempting to believe um, that maybe we're just not explaining ourselves properly. And if we just framed the arguments for the nanny state better. Um, we would get through to the voters. But um, I think that that's assuming that the voters somehow are struggling to understand the situation, but I don't think they are. The voters understand that we're not serious about prevention and they make their decisions uh, accordingly. Um, there's also a lot of uh, heat and uh, emotion that goes into the idea that health is, 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 a, is a social justice issue. And if only we could move the political agenda on to thinking about the inequalities um, that are set in our society, then we could somehow make uh, uh, progress on prevention. Um, and it's definitely a very, it is very, very motivating for health professionals themselves um, to think about the redistribution uh, of, of the nation's wealth. But I'm not sure if the public, the voting public is ready to solve uh, poverty by redistributing wealth. Uh, it's an act of emotional displacement to blame the system rather than to wrestle with realistic solutions. I think it discredits public health arguments and it makes it harder to build an effective alliance for change. Jeremy Corbyn tested the idea of a massive wealth distribution in the 2019 election. I think the experiment failed. I don't think we should be trying to test it again. Um, so the good news is um, uh, that a lot of people are trying to peel back uh, the layers uh, of the onion. Um, there is, for instance, um, uh, a huge move to uh, look at uh, the economics of health. Um, I remind you of Nicholas Stern, the Treasury Mandarin, who took the debate about climate change from the scientists uh, and gave it to the econo uh, economists. Now, what he did by doing that, and this is what we need to do in our area, uh, is to create a price for carbon, which stimulated a massive uh, public and private investment in green tech. 
and he established muscular policy structures uh, to drive change. So a stern report for health that does something similar is absolutely critical for solving the political dead end that we find ourselves in. We need to rethink the cost of life, taking it away from the kind of marginal pricing that qualities are very good at and are a great national asset, but they are very, very bad um, uh, at trying to assess the value of low cost, uncertain early stage interventions, the kind that we do in prevention, uh, that prevent late, uh, late stage catastrophes. So trying to fix the economics of public health and prevention is the critical foundation uh, for making um, uh, progress from that. And I congratulate the IPPR uh, on some of the work um, that they're doing with this. Are we allowed to mention other things? You were encouraged to do so. We have collaborative and it's so good to be here. Mm -hmm. um, now, building on this, the most important step that, that we can take to recognize a, an effective prevention agenda is to, to figure out that we have to take people with us. If we are turning our back on trying to ban our way uh, out of ill health, we have to look at at taking people with us. And, and some, we recognize that some interventions are mandatory, like the syntaxes and the access restrictions. Some are societal, like improving the culture in our toxic workspaces, in our homes and, and, uh, and around the junk food cycle. And some of them are structural, like the design of our healthcare system and investment in housing. And, but it's not reasonable to expect to be able to impose this from above and you have to take people with you. So that's why we should be thinking more about the broader anatomy of health. And what I've tried to put up here is, uh, is, a, is an idea of the kinds of groups that have a bearing on how health is, is seen uh, in the country. Please note, this is different from the structure of the NHS. It's worth remembering the political responses um, are intermediated by the parliamentary process, by the media, uh, and by what voters think other people will think of them. Um, and so that although individual public health measures might have strong public support, that's before they get challenged, before vested interests get um, involved, and before hard choices put to people. So with that in mind, I want to suggest just a few ideas about how we tie the anatomy of Britain into the prevention agenda in a way that's resilient, that stands up to the test of time uh, and creates this new architecture. <clears throat> what we're looking for is ways of getting key players to fight for prevention. Because my fear is that if we don't have that, then we won't make progress. So for instance, if we were to start with social justice, city mayors are absolutely uh, critical players uh, in this. Um, they are the people who um, are negotiating the city deals. They are the people who can um, uh, make the case for generous provisions to uh, reset the wider determinants of health. And if we don't have Andy Burnham, Andy Street, uh, and um, Sadiq Khan fighting for the prevention agenda, then we can't make progress. Now, I am really heartened by what Sadiq has done with the ULEs. He has turned clean air into an amazing electoral asset, and he's deliberately picking a fight uh, with, the, with potential conservative candidates over Ulysses, and I suspect he's gonna win that fight. So there is, there are encouraged, and um, Andy Burnham has done well in terms of uh, uh, bringing health uh, money into his city deal, but we need uh, Ben Houchen, uh, and we need uh, mayors up and down the country to be having health at the center of, of their negotiations. In terms of leaders of the council, uh, I spoke to um, uh, a, a key Tory strategist uh, yesterday and said, uh, can you tell me some examples of some tweets and stuff of where health came up in the local elections? There was nothing. Health is not a local council issue, I was told. Well, that is totally heartbreaking. By the way, we will never, ever win on the um, uh, health prevention agenda if local leaders of local council don't think uh, that health is uh, an important um, uh, uh, um, agenda point. And in terms of the addiction industry, what I mean by addiction industry is not a really good phrase. It's the broader civic society who are involved in uh, alleviating poverty, who are, in, uh, who are campaigning for uh, local services to uh, deal with gambling, alcohol, drugs, uh, obesity. For, that, for them to be given um, a voice in the political, a much clearer voice uh, in the politics of the country 
is essential for us to make progress. Um, secondly, it, what I call the uh, health industrial uh, complex. Um, this is the um, uh, NHS leadership. Uh, at the moment, they are kept in a box and kept away from the prevent uh, deciding on strategy uh, of how money should be allocated between acute, chronic, uh, and preventative and social health. Um, what we need for them is a much clearer alignment of incentives that is around outcomes, not inputs. Now, the creation uh, of ICSs and ICBs is the beginning, is the tiny, very footstep towards trying to do that, but it's incredibly slow progress. Uh, and we know that uh, the kind of timelines uh, that people are talking about is five years to bend down the new system. That needs to be uh, a much more uh, energetic um, uh, process. Uh, secondly, in terms of uh, the pharma industry, the pharma industry, if you speak to them, see huge potential uh, and are extremely excited by the prevention agenda. Um, incremental improvements to current medicines is a way of, of, of making shareholder returns, but it's very dispiriting, and they can see that it's not delivering uh, the value to taxpayers uh, that it has done in the past time. What they are getting, though, is mechanisms for buying their medicines uh, in a way that can encourage the kind of research uh, that is needed. So, so supporting them with um, gold standard regulators uh, and having faster adoption of prevention medicines, um, uh, such as um, the kind of uh, vaccines that might address uh, mental health issues or cancer, uh, it is an important way of trying to bring them as a political force and a champion of the prevention agenda. Uh, thirdly, uh, officials. Uh, officials can only uh, are at their best when they're aligned to very clear um, top line objectives. We have created the health index for England, it's really good. It's just it's not plugged into the decision making processes uh, of Whitehorn at the moment. That needs um, to be much more thoroughly um, uh, integrated into the way in which uh, Whitehall works. Now, um, people often talk about um, uh, a whole of government approach to prevention. I just like to take a little bit of a reality check that it's very unusual to get the whole of government to work behind one single agenda at a time. It's much easier to work at, at, at a lower level. But if there is one way of trying to get government to work, it is by having uh, top line um, uh, objectives like that. Uh, and then lastly, in terms of the colleges, at the moment, as I said, these very, very influential workforce unions um, are, are very much focused on uh, the current setup uh, of, the NA, of the NHS and uh, to be as producer interests for really their own salaries and for their own recruitment and uh, education agendas. That is a real shame. I don't blame them because, act because government is not giving them signals that a change is on the horizon. And if government doesn't give those signals, then it, it would be um, uh, unwise to try to uh, stick your head, head, um, head above the parapet. But what we need is for the BMA, the RNC, the Unison, when things like the smoking statistics come out this morning uh, from ash which i thought were very very powerful uh, or the car review is done uh, or if the diabetes numbers are coming to see that it's in their interests to be agitators for change and champions of prevention um uh, and then uh, thirdly um the economic arguments for prevention are incredibly important uh, and uh, powerful to go in reverse order we can't make any um progress on switching the sources from acute care to prevention, unless the, agent, unless the Treasury themselves are persuaded uh, that the public health uh, agenda can deliver a return uh, on investment. It is extremely skeptical at the moment. By the way, it is extremely skeptical of all long-term interventions. If you speak to the DWP, they have exactly the same uh, struggle um, uh, over worklessness uh, and other social uh, challenges. What we need is Andy Howley uh, to run a uh, stern review for health to create a new formula, uh, as Nick, uh, Nicholas Stone did, um, for uh, long-term prevention and to win that argument uh, with the economists and have it built in to OBR calculations for the future prosperity of the country. In terms of the trade unions, um, they do speak about uh, the safety of workers, but on the whole are not huge champions of things like statutory sick pay and mental health support. Until we have those voices really powerfully banging the table, and calling for action uh, from all the parties, um, as they do um, on salaries and training, um, then it's very difficult to make progress on this. 
In terms of employers, uh, the CBI and Business for Health, I paid huge tribute to John Godfrey, to Tina Woods, and to the, to the gang who run that. But they need to be um, arguing for tax breaks for health interventions. Uh, and as we go into an election time, people like financial donors to political parties should have that on their uh, agenda. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, the patient uh, voter tax there. Um, here, um, uh, I'd like to posit the idea that we need to think about some different contracts that we have with uh, some of the key um, uh, groups that are in the uh, healthcare equation. With the uh, patient voter tax, as I alluded to earlier, at the moment, it is a very one-sided contract that we have. It is that we will pick you up and put you back on your feet uh, at any time uh, for free. A different type of contract would uh, would put more responsibility and more empowerment and more um, agency in people about their own health. And that is sometimes going to be about budgets, about things like social prescribing. It is also about government intervention to improve the environments in which people lead, whether that's breaking the junk food cycle, improving the air, um, leaning in on uh, smoking. But it is also about giving people a greater sense of responsibility that they need to step up to the opportunities for diagnostics and vaccines, that they need to curate their own health through exercise in a, in a sensible, uh, reasonable fashion. Uh, and they need to, in the workplace and in their communities, contribute to um, a, a great sense of, of social health. And that, has got a very strong voter dimension to it. There are different voters who are interested in different dimensions of this agenda. Uh, younger health hackers are interested in the kind of digital technology that allows them to have access to their um, to their health data and incorporates their own um, complicated uh, health arrangements uh, with the NHS. Uh, people who care for children and for elderly relatives are more interested in ensuring that uh, family members when they go into cancer alley, given the vaccines that are coming up uh, from companies like Moderna, or their parents are given dementia tests to ensure that they get the best possible um, care later in their life, and that their children are uh, vaccinated to prevent uh, avoidable diseases as early as possible. Ensuring that those voter groups have um, product that they can engage with on a retail voting basis is really important. And things like community diagnostic types are a really good example of that. And we want to try to, we need to have uh, a way of retailing to voters um, products that are offering a different idea of health than waiting lists uh, and GP numbers. In terms of health professionals, as I, as I suge suggested, the, the producer interest is very focused on uh, the training and uh, remuneration uh, of acute doctors uh, and nurses. Uh, there is a sense in which many feel um, unconfident about whether a prevention agenda will actually deliver a reduction in the demand for healthcare services. We need to win that argument about the efficacy uh, of the prevention uh, interventions so that doctors themselves are making the case for a pivot to prevention. I'm not hearing that case being made and I put it down to a lack of, um, frankly, a lack of confidence that it will actually work. Government can, uh, can create that confidence by itself keeping its end of the bargain. Uh, where, the, where the public see a big role for government is intervening with population-wide mandatory measures on uh, issues where only government can work on, issues like contagious diseases, dirty air. And doctors feel um, that, uh, ministers have ducked those difficult arguments and spend all of their time uh, interfering on clinical decisions or trying to run the healthcare system with um, war rooms and dashboards in Victoria Street around the corner. We need to move away from war rooms and dashboards to politicians delivering on their side of the bargain. And if, if they can do that, then I think that they can change uh, the tone of the conversation uh, with the clinical professionals. And then lastly, with local leaders, I think what you're, I hope what I'm trying to get across is that as a political strategy, instead of having a nanny state that's trying to grab powers for top-down prevention interventions, we actually need a strategy that deliberately tries to give agency and power to uh, mayors, councillors, DPHs, and the people on the front line who can make those decisions and begs in political advocacy for the prevention agenda 
in wider society. And if I may, just very, uh, I'm going to skip this bit because I'm a bit behind schedule. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, why not there? Uh, I was going to tell you a little bit about Wakefield, where um, they lost the battle to close uh, uh, um, some KSP branches in a, in a rather sad intervention. This is my um, uh, this is my summary. At the end of the day, in order to make Britain the healthiest country in the world, we need a political system in which the Prime Minister says, as his mission, I will make Britain the healthiest country in the world, not I will reduce waiting lists. The health secretary is defending the health index performance, not waiting this across the whole of government. Um, we have uh, OHID, newly muscular, like a national security agency, uh, holding politicians across government uh, and their feet to the fire, taking the housing secretary or the transport secretary uh, to task for the dirty air. We have a chancellor who makes the case for the smoking ban because of the impact on productivity, not a chancellor who fights it because of the impact uh, on excise income. We have mayors competing to have the healthiest city in the world uh, and, and competing to have the right powers to implement that. We have MPs fighting for community diagnostic cards. We have councillors leaning in on things like takeaways, minimum pricing and gambling. We have employers demanding greater tax breaks for the rollout of uh, therapies and apps in the workplace. Um, and lastly, we have patient voters engaged in personal health uh, through uh, digital tech. If we can get to that kind of political economy, then I think we can be the healthiest country as well. Um, I think there is obviously a um, huge breadth of content and ambition there. Um, I'm very conscious of time. I'm actually going to, I, I had a bunch of questions I was going to ask you. I'm not, I'm going to keep you around, but keep you behind that because we, we can talk a little problem. So I'm just going to open it up to, 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 to yours. And I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Kevin first. I know he's going to get away if, in a hurry. So if that's all right, Kevin first, then, 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 then first of all, I'll after that. So here's Kevin, you, you go, go, go first. Wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. That was a great overview. And I'm really pleased that you shone a light on political determinants of power and the importance of aligning political leadership at national, regional, and local level. Um, one of the areas where I think your argument could be even further strengthened is that laser focus on inequalities, because this is one of the, the things that really came out in the COVID pandemic when we worked on this, where you saw COVID manifesting itself so differently in different communities, mm -hmm. by socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, age, and gender, that was there. And I wonder how we could weave this into your narrative so that we do both. Yeah. Strong yeah. leadership and making politics. So um, you pointed to a really big dilemma. I, I also, um, during the pandemic, felt those inequalities hugely. I had no idea. I mean, I knew intellectually that there were health inequalities, but I really lived and breathed it during the pandemic. And I had no doubt at all in terms of clinical necessity addressing those issues is hugely important. But politically, it is a more difficult agenda. Of the 20 most deprived constituencies in Britain, 19 of them are Labour. If you look at the wards where there is the greatest deprivation, they are generally Labour. If you look at voters and their attitudes to health inequalities, they have a very strong feeling that people's um, health is their own responsibility. There is not a lot of sympathy amongst voters for you know, their <laughs> citizens struggle with their environments and the places in which they live. So as a political message and as a way of galvanizing political support, the clinical need for addressing health inequalities, which is undoubted and I fully support, does not directly read across to a political message. And I think we need to, I don't have the answer for that, but I think it is a mistake or it's, it's singing to the choir if you, if you seek to try to make your, the focus of your political arguments about inequalities and you are, you are in danger of alienating quite a lot of the people for whom you rely on for support. So I, I yeah, yes. really great question. I don't have a full answer, but I don't think that, um, I think that area has to be trodden with care, with caution. 
Um, uh, first of all, I should say, do, do you please introduce yourselves? Uh, as you, as you, as you, sorry, Kevin, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you, you do uh, just the benefit of the audience and the, uh, and the camera. So, um, uh, Julie Marto, behavior, Stephen, Cambridge. So, I'm partly going to answer Kevin's question. I think Jessica be your final slide. Um, ambition that, that first line having a grand ambition by a prime minister saying i will make britain the healthiest country in the world for everybody mm -hmm. what we know is that populations care about place-based inequality so that's an important way of framing and the next thing if we look where there has been more success than anywhere else i think in the uk and policy making it's climate change so I think your second bullet point should be to legislate with an act similar to the Climate Change Act, such that um, uh, governments are required uh, to monitor and report progress and to have policies that are fit for purpose. And we know that for climate change, we're pretty much on track where we veered, and uh, unfortunately it did take uh, the spread of the earth um, and others uh, to take a support, but uh, that has led to um, government needing to look at their policies to ensure they're fit for purpose. I'm sure you're informed about that. So yeah. could you comment on how that might be able to a, 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 a little bit of equivalent of the net zero time. Yes. I think what I'm trying to say is it's different than that. Now, I, I understand the really trusted climate, and there are, there are some really positive really trusted effects. But the idea that the problem we've got is that we don't have the equivalent of a net zero is wrong. We have it in our plans. That's the point I was trying to make. There is no shortage of policy commitment to addressing health inequalities. Absolutely. Uh, like, it really isn't. It isn't a lack of clarity. It's all written in white papers, in... Um, Long term NHS long term plans. It's in the Conservative and Labour manifestos. It isn't a lack of political. Over. The problem with the prevention agenda in the UK is it's friendless. It has no what no champions whatsoever. You can completely dump the calm review, and there isn't a murmur. You can have six million diabetes patients, and that it, it doesn't doesn't create any stir whatsoever. And this idea that that the answer therefore is to is to go in at the top and to legislate or to or to have a single line that you know somehow we use language to cleverly tweak it. I think that's wrong headed. It's it's the mindset of a sort of a very top down healthcare system that somehow things can be fixed by by the people at the top by getting the words right in law. The problem is that no one believes in the UK that public health interventions really make a difference. There's no confidence that they work. No one has any agency to implement them properly. And there is not a lot of advocacy to, to make sure that they really happen. And until we change our mindset, thinking about, okay, now how do we roll up our sleeves and create advocacy? How do we create people who can make decisions? How do we give a DPH the, the, the legal um, authority to turn down planning permissions for takeaways near primary schools and then hold them accountable for the impact of that, those decisions, then we're not going to, to make progress. And I fear that conversations about things like, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm, I'm coming in hard on this, not just to try to illustrate my point, that, that conversations about things like net zero style acts for health is sort of emotional displacement. It's a way of distracting ourselves from the hard work that really needs to be done of building support at, at, at a sort of voter professional level. Um, the hand, uh, at the very back. Um, just as it's really quick on the point around, you know, the climate change taking it out of the hands of, you know, the health um, professionals and economists, which I think is a, a really interesting qualification. What are the steps to do that? Um, so in my dream, in my dream, um, the Treasury, Jeremy Hunt appoints a credible person like Andy Haldane to do a review of uh, the mechanisms for 
assessing the economic value of early stage health prevention. And those would cover everything from clinical vaccines and diagnostics uh, through to environment, dirty hair, junk food, gambling, smoking, um, childhood uh, abuse. And, th and they create a, a formula for uh, trying to understand how an intervention that has a um, low probability, but low probability high impact event can be, can be valued. So if you give someone a vaccine against cancer, if their risk of actually getting that cancer are one in a thousand, that you save 10,000 cancers, how do you pay for that vaccine? How do you, how do you pay for that uh, intervention with someone's addiction? How do you pay for the education of people around food or, or, or gambling? That, that economic science, we just don't have here in, in the, anywhere in the world. I mean, I've, I've looked high and low, someone can, you know, but that is the fundamental challenge with prevention. We're very, very good at assessing the value of a cancer drug. You've got three months to live and a cancer drug is going to give you another three months of life. Nice and other and the health economics economics we have in uh, places like Victoria Street are incredibly thoughtful about assessing that value. They're not at assessing a longer term value. Um, right, we're going to come to you. We've got two questions um, there, there and there, which we will do together. We've got about three minutes left, so it's going to be very crisp. Perched in there, and those questions and answers. So, um, lay there, and then you know. Yeah, my suspicion was the research UK really interesting. My question was, you have a long list of all the things you need to do, which are even really top, really bottom. Which is the priority, which would give you a great answer? So, the quick answer to that one. That we we're we're great question. So, there is a sequence. Uh, I, I, have, I can't quite figure it out. I did try. I think that there are some things that government can do early on to create confidence. I think that there are some signals to the voter and to the clinical professionals that, that say, we mean business. They may not, so they might be the cheaper things, and they might be some of the things that um, uh, get some early wins. So civil was quite a good. The, the, the stop drinks industry levy. Thank you. I always get the precise name on. Um, the stop drinks industry levy, you know, uh, brought in 300 million quid a year um, and has reduced sugar by 50 million tons. So that's that's been an early win. I think there are interventions on things like smoking. Uh, the gambling levy is, is another good one. What we need is, is some big ones on that in order to create the climate where we can sanction some really big money on things like multi homes um, and some big investments on things like uh, diagnostic hubs, vaccines. Sure. Not with the fiscal, is that it? Yes, no. only because they are quite cheap. Good. Right. So swinging in from that end of the telescope <laughs> right down to the other one at the moment. Uh, and I agree with all of those, but that's at a very large population level. It's not yeah. me, it's government, yeah. and they don't need to worry about it. How do we swing from a population health conversation to personalised prevention? What you can individually do? Yeah. And I've, I've talked with Don Deanfield, indeed, when we were at the Victoria Street, uh, sorry, Sun Eccles, now at Salesforce, formerly uh, NHS 19 for far too long. Um, in, in, in any other world, in retail, we talk about the cost to acquire an individual uh, and the cost to keep them and the risk of attrition from whatever service it is we provide. In the case of good health, how do we change the debate so both private and NHS can talk to the individual about the cost of making them healthy, the value derived to society from helping them be healthy, and then the ongoing value of keeping them yeah. Uh, you know, as a 52-year-old man, I'm the current target of bowel disease uh, for prevention and shortly will be sent something by the NHS. I'm seeing an advert on the back of a bus as it passed through, but nothing to me on any social media saying, you're in line for this. We are really bad at personalising our preventative health measures. Can we flip that telescope around as well? Absolutely. Uh, and, um... I, I spoke about it very clumsily, and, and um, I should talk to you, Simon, about it. The, when I talk about rebooting the relationship um, with the voter patient uh, 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 taxpayer, uh, for some of them, that is going to be really important. Now, there are some people, quite a lot of people, who don't want to have uh, engagement on, you know, digital engagement on their health. And I think we need to be realistic. But there is quite a big group, particularly of younger people, for whom um, you know, personalised connection with their health is, is something they're already beginning to do on their Fitbits and what have you. 
And they, their expectation of any kind of engagement, whether it's with the tax system, uh, with DVLA, with any, any other uh, big corporate or government, is that it all the data is there, all the information is there. You have latitude and, and agility in the way in which you want to engage with the system. The NHS is way behind on that. And I think that getting that personalization uh, right and creating a sense of agency and empowering people to curate their own health by giving them the tools to do it through the app and through diagnostics and through vaccines and things like that is the way that we reboot the relationship so that it's less about the NHS will be there when you fall over and have your heart attack and more about this um, uh, two-way uh, contract that we will help you look after yourself and be there when it doesn't work out. We're now a minute after to, uh, over time, but I'm, so I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up by asking one one very brief question in my own. This is before we finish, um, which is about politics, because you, you, the earlier conversations are about what you call political architecture. And just you, you, you give me a very, a very quick answer um, uh, to what's probably a very long and rambling question. Uh, as you look at politics today, politicians and political parties. Um, do you see any individuals or any party that gets this? Yeah, who, who is who is doing who, who, who do you think gets it and is doing good? Yeah. Well, this, good this, good. I'll give you a short answer. There is a really great society called the Guild of Former Health Ministers, <laughs> <laughs> and it includes Andy Burnham, Jeremy Hunt, <laughs> Patricia Hewitt. Uh, anyone who has been in the health system knows that this is critically important and if you get any of us together it's all we talk about I, what and I, the I, general I, 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 practicing I, 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 people who are up, up for election next time round they talk about people like you in slightly less complementary terms and they would say it's very easy for you to sit there you've done the job you're out you're, you're out of the game you're not up for election yes. you're not up for election i've got to get elected next time round. so so people who are currently who, who, are, who are up for election next time round, who, who are going you know, to make this stuff Vote winning. Yes, yeah. who's, who's who's doing it well? So I think it, I think it's uh, I I don't have any, I mean Andy Bowman is very good in Manchester, but he's part of the guild. Um, <laughs> Boyce speaking has spoken when he was health minister, spoke adventurously about the smoking ban. But people, I remember when uh, before the Tories got in, David Cameron used to sort of say, you know, exciting things about things he would do in government, and then when he was in government, he <laughs> never had the guts to do it. Right. Um, so. Um, um, I think it's quite bleak. Um, I don't have any sort of like shining example. And that's why I'm taking the approach that I have done, because I don't think it is very easy to move the weather uh, as a senior politician. That's why we need to, uh, to think again about creating champions and people who are demanding this stuff to happen, to make it easier. Uh, if I, it, there, is a, there is a great prevalence to, to assume that voters don't want to have the donuts taken away from them, they don't want to have their cigarette packets taken away from them, that they are resistant to these changes. I, I think that is politically unsophisticated. But what is problematic is that in Parliament and in the media uh, and, in, and in the vested interests, there are too many people saying that change is impossible, but there is no, no one on the other side of that equation arguing with them. We have another half hour. We are happy to talk about politics in the media and yeah. my, our, both of our former lives, but we are, we are now sadly over time. Um, so, with that, I will um, wrap up. We're going to put your speech on online. The, slide, the slides and the text on, on, on our website, great. So, they'll, they will be up on the internet website. You can, you can, you can absorb those, uh, those again. So, with that, I'm just going to yeah, thank all of, all of you, Calvary. I mean, ask you before you go to give one, one last kind of appreciation to us because you're doing both. Thank you very much.